the Hebrews, Jehovah's warriors. In the fertile Tigris and Euphrates valleys, ruled by Babylonian and Assyrian masters, lived a people who disdained the hordes of good and evil demons. They opposed the ostentatious, vain, and terror-inspiring idols, worshipping instead a single deity, a spiritual godhead that did not reside in images but was at once both invisible and omnipotent, reigning above the material world. In the 8th century before Christ, the most prominent Jews were deported to Assyria, and the Assyrians forced strange gods upon Jerusalem. In 605 BC, Babylon rose again to establish a new Chaldean world empire, and King Nebuchadnezzar banished more Jews to the Euphrates Valley. Then, as the people in Palestine continued to rebel, still more Jews were deported to Chaldea. After the murder of a Babylonian governor in Jerusalem, the remaining Hebrews escaped the king's wrath by fleeing to Egypt. These kings of Mesopotamia thought perhaps that the vanquished would merge with the populations of their own kingdoms. But this stubborn minority, preserving its individuality, held its own against foreign ways. Perhaps a feeling of guilt among the captives caused a temporary tightening of morals. For they thought that surely this banishment to a heathen land was sent by Jehovah to punish his people for their uncleanliness in the past. The greatest uncleanliness of all consisted in the cult of idols and the practice of magic. Had not the Hebrew prophets repeatedly warned their people that the Holy Land would no longer suffer these abominations, that it would spew forth its sacrilegious inhabitants? The false gods proved powerless before fate. None had prevented the devastation of Palestine. The dispersed Jews could now reflect with shame and disgust upon these faithless gods. They had learned from the Egyptians to worship Beelzephon. A mare or dog, tradition says, was in his likeness set up according to the rules of astrology. Impure, Ammonitic Beelphagor dwelt in pits and rocky clefts, and at the time of the Exodus the Jews, seduced by the women of Sittim, were dissolutely sacrificing to Beelphagor's idols. Moral purity was not his strong point, and Hosea thus protests against his disruptive influence. Therefore your daughters play the harlot, and your sons' wives commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they play the harlot, nor your sons' wives when they commit adultery. For they themselves go with harlots, and sacrifice with temple prostitutes, and people without insight must go to ruin. The Jews had also worshipped Dagon, the fishwoman, goddess of the Philistines. Her gigantic bronze image was in the form of a beautiful woman, whose body, like the Syrian goddess Dersito and Durs of Ascalon, ended in a huge fishtail. Then there was the Babylonian goddess, Succoth Benoth. She was represented, the legend says, as a hen with her chicks. Asima, god of the Emethites, had the figure of a he-goat, Anamelech, that of a horse, and the Samaritan Nergal, that of a cock. In Acheron, Beelzebub's image was that of a fly, and the Israelites' king Achaz sent for him in vain, to cure his sickness. The most gruesome deity was the Ammonitic Moloch, gobbler of children. He alone of all the idols had no temple in Jerusalem. Even during the time of great decadence, he did not venture into the holy city. The nearby Valley of the Sons of Himon sheltered his iron image. Leading his followers astray in wantonness, he rejoiced at their doom. Moloch is identical with the Hebraic Melech, king. The purpose of his cult was originally to gain health and long life for the king, who is expected to use his magic powers for the benefit of the people, in particular to obtain good harvests. But Moloch's price was too high, and the people had to burn their own children to please him. Gorged with the lives of his victims, Moloch dominated over Hinnom. Cymbals, trumpets, and drums filled the air with barbaric din, drowning out the shrieks of his victims. In spite of all these waverings and regressions to the old idol worship, the Jews were an exception among the nations of antiquity. Ever and again, enlightened prophets arose to remind them of their ancient compact with the Eternal. 
And during times of misfortune and persecution, the Jewish people remembered the one Lord, recognizing in their misery the stern and righteous hand of the jealous God. In this conception of misfortune, the Jews differed from their neighbors, who believed that ill fortune stemmed from evil powers with whom they must compromise when their counter-magic had failed. Today we know that Israel had no monopoly of the idea of one God, nor can the chosen people claim to have been the first to conceive monotheism, which, we know also, became the Egyptian state religion under the young monarch Amenhotep IV. He declared the old deities deposed, and over priestly opposition enforced the religion of the one God, Aton, a name which may have lived on in the Hebrew Adonai, Lord. Aton would suffer no images, and the disk of the sun was his only symbol. Amenhotep, who with the new cult changed his name to Akhenaten, also abolished the cult of the dead with all its magical rites. Yet Aton was short-lived. The kingly reformer died in 1358 BC, and soon afterwards Aton was overthrown, having never gained popularity among a people so fond of the sculptured image. Neighboring peoples, whether friends or enemies, learn from one another and an exchange of ideas takes place between them, so that for good or for evil they are linked. In spite of their stubborn resistance, the exiled Jews were not able to withstand foreign influences. If the apocryphal book of Tobit can be relied on, the Jews at Nineveh were not confined to separate communities. Many attained dignity and wealth. Tobit was buyer for King Shalmaneser V, journeying to Media on official business, and apparently to other lands of Western Asia. Under the succeeding king, Esarhaddon, the conqueror of Egypt, Tobit's nephew became secretary of the treasury, in charge of all the accounts of the kingdom. Many forgot their homeland, only a few perhaps remaining steadfast in their faith. Thus, Tobit could complain, all my brothers and relatives ate the food of the heathen, but I kept myself from eating it, because I remembered God with all my heart. Even those who had remained in Palestine were hardly better able to withstand Assyrio-Babylonian influences. From the incensed writings of Ezekiel, we learn of Israel's countless relapses into the various beliefs of its conquerors. With few exceptions, the people were fascinated by foreign religions and magic practices, which were carried into the very temple at Jerusalem. Lo, there were all sorts of loathsome forms of reptiles and beasts, together with all the idols of Israel. And at the north gate of the temple, lo, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Still greater sacrilege was to be seen. Between the vestibule and the altar, about twenty-five men, with their backs to the tabernacle of the Lord and their faces to the east, were worshipping the sun of the east. The abhorred gods of the Mesopotamians, the cult of the Persians, had invaded the Holy of Holies, and at its gates the shrill pipe and plaintive flute were being played in honour of the ancient god Tammuz, whom the Sumerians had worshipped in the past as Dumuzi, the true sun. They gave Tammuz to the Hebrews. Tammuz was the youthful lover of Ishtar, the great mother goddess, the embodiment of productive power, the female principle. Like Astrate, Cybele, Aphrodite, and Isis, she was the receptacle of life and growth. As Tammuz, the man-god, dies and descends into the underworld, he is bewailed by all that is female. Ishtar follows her dead lover and wrests him from the infernal powers. Tammuz comes back to life for the sake of all life, and when the couple return to the light of day, nature rejoices, and vegetative activity, which had stopped during Ishtar's hell journey, starts anew. From time immemorial, Ishtar had been honored by the women and maidens of Western Asia. A magical custom which aimed at stimulating the goddess's productive power accompanied the ancient cult in the form of prostitution. The usage probably dated back to the time when marriage was unknown or forbidden as an infringement upon the old communal rites. And the goddess Ishtar was thought to be unchaste and unwed, an abomination to the true believer in Israel. 
The Jewish people passed through many crises and many relapses into various old and abolished cults, such as that of Tammuz, and they borrowed new elements which attached themselves to the monotheistic religion. The notions of Daniel and of Ezekiel have quite a Persian character, and there is a thoroughly Persian flavor to Tobit's story of his daughter-in-law Sarah, a Median Jewess. She was possessed by the evil demon Ashmedai, who had killed seven of Sarah's betrothed. Ashmedai must be cast out. To this end, incense was mixed with the heart and liver of fish and put on a burner. And when the demon smelled the smoke, he fled to the farthest part of Upper Egypt, and the angel Raphael bound him there. After the rise of Zoroastrian Magianism, Israel witnessed the collapse of her oppressors, when during the mid-sixth century, Mesopotamian might was shattered and the Persians rode into Babylon. Forty thousand Jews returned to the now deserted and gutted Jerusalem. Through their political defeat, the Jews had lost faith in the stability of earthly kings. God's kingdom was not on earth. Palestine, they recognized, was the crossroads through which marched the armies of powerful empires, and only the coming of the Messiah could free them from their political misery. Like the Zoroastrians, they were preoccupied with the life to come after death, unknown to the old religion of Moses. They longed for the establishment of the heavenly kingdom which would mark the end of their hopeless struggle.